Well, good morning, church. We are in the month of February. Can you believe that? Did, did January just kind of like zip on by for, for some of us? Um, when I was thinking about the year 2023, I wanted to begin by doing a series of messages, which we did, um, called Through the Bible 2023, because a number of us were signing up online or signing up in the back to read through the Bible in 2023. So I wanted to provide some practical tools that no matter where we were reading in the Bible that we would be able to kind of look at these sheets and and what started out as just two weeks ended up being a sermon series that was the entire month of January. What I also wanted to do that I'm going to do now, although it's a little bit late because we have one month behind us already, is I wanted to do a couple messages that were kind of like Happy New Year messages, messages that I'm going to call off to a great start, that how do we get off to a great start? How do we get off to a great start in our year? As it is a time that many of us make goals and resolutions, how do we get off to a great start in our week? And as I think, as I talk about that, and this is only going to be this week and next week, but I want you right now on a scale from one to 10, just think about how you would describe the year 2023. Like, like for some of us, we think, okay, January's gone by, four days of February have gone by, and January, I mean, this year, 2023 has gone pretty well. That's, that's kind of like how I look at 2023. Some of us would say, yeah, it's a going to seven or eight or nine, or maybe there's some tens out there. But then there are others of us that we look at 2023, and, and maybe there's things outside our, our control, right? that we look at and because of things, these things that are present in our lives or we're dealing with this or that, that we can say, you know what, 2023 hasn't been the greatest. You know, because there, there are things that we have control of, right? And there are things in life that we can't control. And the secret of wisdom is to not try to control the things we can't control, but to control the things that we can control. And that's what I want to talk to you this morning, because I believe that no matter where you are in 2023, on a scale from 1 to 10, that what we are going to look at today and next week will encourage us wherever we are on our journey together. So I would invite you to turn your Bible to Psalm 1. I want to look today at how to make this year your best year yet. How to make this year your best year yet. And to do that, I want you to turn to the very first psalm. Uh, by the way, the way this message series came about, and I was going to do, I was going to do like six messages, but because of some schedule adjustments in the schedule, it's only going to be two weeks. But I wanted to share with the church um, some of the scriptures that were a part of my Bible memorization. And what was interesting is I had this app on my phone uh, called Bible Memory. And it was the app that, and it wasn't every single day. There were seasons where every single day it took place. But there were a number, dozens of verses that I was in the process of memorizing. Psalm 1, Psalm 1 and the message I'll speak next week were just two of those, those scriptures and right as I began to write out, out of all these scriptures, like the top five or six that I wanted to speak on, uh, my phone updated, and I lost all of that. Uh, my, my apps stopped working. So uh, while I no longer have this on my phone for memorization, uh, I want to share it with you. It's a great psalm, an encouraging psalm. Chapter 1. Of the book of Psalms, by the way, the book of Psalms is the longest book in the entire Bible, so those of you that are reading through the Bible, um, that's the time to just hunker down with your coffee or tea and just know you're going to be in Psalms for a little while unless you're only dipping in here and there uh, every day of the year. Um, but many believe, and I think this is a good, good intro to it, that Psalm 1 kind of serves as an intro psalm to the entire book of Psalms. It's that good. And it reads as follows. Blessed is the man 
who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. What I want to share to you, with you this morning are three things that are in your control. Because as I said earlier, there are things that happen to us, there are things that we will experience in 2023 that we don't have a say in. We don't have control over. But then there are choices, decisions that we have the power to choose to do or to choose not to do. And if we choose to do these things, life just has a way of working a little bit better, sometimes a whole lot better. First thing, follow what is right and not what is popular. You know, I think that's great advice. That's, that's advice that our children need to hear, right? I was reminded as we were praying for our kids this morning, our, our teenagers and our, and our youngest children, from the youngest and, and some, some parents in our congregation in the next year and two are, are going to be making decisions related to school and what to do about all of that. And this is, is great advice to give to those children because of the peer pressure. And because of the things that our kids will face that, that not only did we not face, it, it never even entered into our mind that this would be a possibility that we would have to face such a challenge. And the challenge for our young people is to obviously stand up for what they believe in, but then also give a reason for the hope that they have in Christ and to do this with all people with what? Gentleness and respect. We love everyone, respect everyone, we just don't agree with everyone. But I want to say this to you. Uh, I think that when I was a teenager, I thought that, you know, when I get out of school, when I get out of college, when I get out of, I'll never have to deal with pressure again. I'll never have to deal with peer pressure, right? It's kind of like that, that, you know, it's just going to be smooth sailing. But I found out, you know what, there's peer pressure that you go through as a teenager and a child. And there's peer pressure that you go through as an adult. So this temptation to choose what is easier, to choose what is popular versus what is right will stay with us. But I want you to look at verse 1. Verse 1, I love it. Blessed is the man. By the way, if you're a woman here, this is you too. Uh, this, this means men and women. Who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. It was Albert Einstein who first said this, that what is right isn't always popular, and what is popular isn't always right. And what I see in verse 1 is somebody who is willing to go against the flow. And God is looking for people today in our neighborhoods, in our relationships, in our workplaces, to be people who are willing to go against the flow, willing to not take the most popular stand when God calls us to. And again, I can't emphasize enough that we do it with gentleness, we do it with respect, we do it with with love for all people. But did you notice here that in in verse 1 it says, blessed is the man or woman. Now, man refers to one dude, right? Woman refers to one dudette. (laughs) 
So he's saying, blessed is the man, the singular individual. But notice that when it comes to the wicked, the sinners, the scoffers, they're all plural. Why? Because the walk to follow God, whether it's in, in the Bible times or today's times, will always cause us at times to swim uphill. To go against the grain, to not do what is right. And it's almost like you've got this picture of this man, and there's this crowd out there, and some of them are saying this, and some of them are saying that, but, but this person, this man, this woman is standing strong, willing to take the stand that is right, even though it's not popular. To make this our best year, I think this. We have to be very intentional in the counsel that we listen to. And we're getting counsel all the time, by the way. We are getting it from television. We are getting it from radio. We are getting it from social media. We are getting it from internet. We are getting it from other other areas that we allow into our lives. And just last night, uh, you know, there something happened. Beth and I were watching TV, and this show came on, and we've never seen the show before, whatever. And it's kind of like we looked at each other and said, "Never again." Never again. This just, this just crossed too many lines. And, and w- I, even though, like many people would say, oh, what a prude, uh, I know that, that it just isn't good. It's not healthy. It's not godly for where I want and where we want our, our minds to be. I remember reading in the Bible, this is absolutely free, I didn't have it on my outline this morning. I remember reading in the Bible, in the book of Leviticus, this will be an encouragement if you're reading through the Bible, or if you happen to pick up your Bible and say, I think I'll read Leviticus today. Leviticus is not an easy book to understand. And Leviticus has all these laws, most of which we don't practice today. And I remember having a conversation with God, and it tells this story like, here's what you do if you get mold in your cave or in your house. And it talks about declaring your house a contaminant site and living outside of your home for seven days and calling on the priest. And then the priest, who was not only like a priest, but he was a doctor and a home inspector and all, he would come into your cave home or your home and inspect your walls to see if that mildew or or that mold had had been cleaned up so that you could move back in. And I remember reading that and kind of having this thought that I didn't know God was listening to. And I thought to myself, what in the world does this have to do with my life? And I didn't know that when I thought that thought, God heard it. Because immediately in my spirit, God spoke to me and said, you know what? You may not have any mold on your walls, but the way contamination comes today is what is on our walls because that's where we hang most of our televisions. And I said, wow, I got to pay attention to Leviticus. Isn't it true? We need to be uh, value and protect our mind from the counsel that we listen to. You know, there's a lot of scared, paranoid people because they're listening to scared, paranoid advice. Number two, the course we follow, the counsel we listen to, the course we follow, because guess what, friends? All roads do not lead to blessing. And, is not, and it is not the road of what we say that will lead to blessing alone in our lives. What we say has to be backed up by our walk, the course we follow. And, and I saw this verse, and, and it's like it says that this man or this woman, this individual doesn't even stand in the way of sinners. And and the word way that's used here, by the way, just kind of refers to a highway, a pathway. And it's almost like you get this picture that this this person who wants to keep themselves 
in, in godliness and in relationship that's close with, with God, they don't even stand near where others are choosing to walk. And then, and then thirdly, the company that we keep. And again, it's not just advice for kids, right? How many of you would say to your children, okay, son, okay, daughter, okay, precious flesh that I gave life to, you're going to go to school and there's going to be about 30 other children in the classroom. You just look for the ones that are doing everything wrong and follow them. I remember my eighth grade year. They used to do this. I don't know if they do this anymore. They used to tell whose class you were in. And I looked at, in my eighth grade year, and I looked at all the kids that I was put into with. And I thought in my little eighth grade mind, I am doomed. <laughs> Sad to say, several of them are no longer alive because of decisions that they've made. But I looked at that and I thought, oh my goodness gracious. I mean, like all the tough kids were in my class. These were the ones that thought fighting was a school sport and they won the letter in it. Uh, and I thought, oh my goodness. But then something else happened in my eighth grade year. Yeah, I got in that class and boy, it was a rough start, but it ended up being one of my best years ever. Because the second thing that happened in my year, eighth grade year was I gave my life to Jesus and came to know him in a personal way. Now, I had started to pray from day one, but, you know. <laughs> but the company we keep. Now, how we live this is given in verse 2, but verse 4 explains why following what is popular over what is right is a bad idea. So we're going to look at verse 2, which is the good stuff, the to-do stuff, the stuff that you and I have the power to choose to do or to look at and say, ah, I'm not sure. He says this in verse Four. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Now, obviously, the, the, the metaphor, the picture here is from the world of agriculture. In fact, there are places all over our world today. I'm assuming most of this is done with machines in our nation, but there are nations in the world today where they, where they harvest grain in a very similar way that was done in Bible times. And I've actually, I actually looked this up on YouTube. I was looking for a, a YouTube video that I could actually show. But what they would do in Bible times is that they would get that, that wheat, that grain, that precious stuff, and, and they would just begin to, to beat it, to beat it down, to, be, you know, to break the wheat from the chaff. In fact, I saw in a YouTube video, uh, one way that it's being done on around the world today is they'll take that weed and they'll put it in like a canvas bag and just stomp this thing to death. But then what would happen is all that chaff would be broken from the wheat. But I mean, who wants to, you know, who wants to eat chaff along with your wheat? You can't eat chaff. Chaff's not good. So they would take what was called a winnowing fork. In fact, John the Baptist speaks of this in relationship to Jesus. Because you see, that precious wheat, the good stuff, weighed a lot more than the bad stuff, the stuff you can't eat. And they would stick that winnowing fork in, and they would always have a threshing floor that was at high elevation because that where it was, that's where it was windiest. And they would take that, and as they would throw it in the air, you would see, and I saw again on a, on a, two, a YouTube video, uh, you see this wheat falling to the ground and the, and the wind just driving away the chaff, taking the chaff away. And the Bible says that the wicked, the wicked decisions and actions lead to being like chaff, no weight, no substance, no stability, uh, I thought of chaff. chaff. You can't eat chaff. Chaff has nothing to offer anyone. I was reading in, in the Bible last week, and again, this was this year through the Bible. The Leviticus story was from another year of reading through the Bible, so thank you for, for this because by participating in this. So I'm reading in Leviticus, right? 
and, and uh, uh, Exodus. And I think that there's a lot. It, it, this reminded me that there are a lot of things in the Bible that are humorous, but we don't look at them as humorous. Like, like we forget that maybe Hebrew people had a sense of humor too. And that, the thing, that sometimes in the Bible, not all the times, but sometimes they would write things in such a humorous way that when these stories were retold, retold there would be laughter in the room. Here's one of them, I believe, that, that contains Hebrew humor. Remember, the children of Israel, they're, they're, the exodus has not yet happened. They're in Egypt, and all these plagues are coming upon the land of Egypt. Remember that? And, uh, you know, like the water turns to blood or whatever. Well, the second one, I believe it's the second one, is there's like all these frogs in the land of Egypt, remember? And, and by the way, God was doing this to show the superiority of Israel's God over the gods of Egypt. So all of these frogs are in the land, right? So imagine like going outside and you can't even walk to your car without getting squishy under your foot and all this. So, so things are bad and I'm sure like they stunk and all this. And there are these Egyptian magicians. These are the people that the Egyptians look to. These were the people that had the answers. In fact, they were so powerful and had such a position of influence that they were the people that the Pharaoh looked to. And the Bible tells us that in the midst of all these frogs teeming everywhere, that that those magicians with magic arts were able to create more frogs. I don't know about you, but I, had a, I have a question. I would like to go back in time and say, time out. Egyptian, magician, dude, you've got a big problem. There's frogs in your land. Why are you adding to the problem? And as I was reading that in my Bible, thinking that thought, this is what dropped into my spirit, that the answer apart from God, can only increase the problem. Have we seen problems in our world increased because the advice, the counsel, just created more frogs? The scripture says this, by the the way, this is God's will for your life and my life, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. That means teaching. It sounds, sounds good, but it isn't good because it doesn't line up to God's word. By human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Want to start this year off great? Follow what is right and not what is popular. Second, commit. This is important. Don't let this escape you because you've heard it in church before. Commit to becoming a disciple of Christ and not a dabbler. You know what a dabbler is, right? Just a little bit. Not super committed. Get my toe wet, but I'm not diving in. Verse 2 says this, and by the way, I want to remember, I really hope you remember this. If you don't remember anything from, from our previous series, I pray that this would be the one thing that you would remember, is that when you are reading in your Bible and you see the word, the law, or the law of the Lord, which I would prefer the instruction or the instruction of the Lord, that your mind immediately goes to Jesus and New Testament because the Bible tells us that Jesus is the end of the law, not that Jesus ended the law, but that the law was a pathway, a driveway to get us to our final destination. So when I read this, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, And on his law, he meditates day and night. This is what I read. But his delight is in Jesus. And on Jesus, he meditates day and night. Oh, that we would be people that would delight in Jesus. And not just dabble. Now, I I think you probably know that when the Bible says this, that on, on his law or on Jesus, he meditates day and night that he doesn't mean that 
in its most literal way. Like, I got the afternoon free. Means all the time, doesn't it? In fact, let me give you a smart word. The smart word of the day is the word merism, M-E-R-I-S-M. We use them all the time in our language. A merism is where you take two opposite things like day and night and put them together, day and night, but what you really mean is not day and night, but you mean day and night and everything in between. If I lost my keys and I said I searched high and low for them, you wouldn't think, okay, have you looked on the table? Because that's not high, that's not low. You would know, I mean all the time that we would be people that would delight in Jesus all the time. I looked up the word dabble, and it said to work or involve oneself, and I bolded these words, they were not bolded in the dictionary, superficially. We can be superficial in our faith. Or intermittently. We can be intermittently, intermittent in our faith, off and on, off and on especially in a secondary activity or interest. See, all of these words, superficially, barely scratching the surface, shallow, intermittently, off and on, involved only when convenient, or secondary, following Jesus takes a back seat and a back burner to other priorities and and pursuits. Now, I welcome, we welcome everyone and anyone to this church. We welcome those here this morning and those who will come through our doors who may be dabblers in the faith. Maybe just kind of checking it out, seeing what it's, what it's about. But let me say this. Dabblers are not disciples. And disciples are not dabblers. Disciples commit to what I call the six ships of the church. Show me somebody that has commitment in these areas, and I'm going to look at that person, and I'm going to learn from them because they're following Jesus as a disciple, and and every disciple that's following Jesus has something to show me and teach me. Number one, worship, proclaiming God's greatness to others. Now, you can check off that box because you're here this morning. Now, let me just say this. I've always, it's kind of like it's one of these things like, you know, as, as a pastor of a church, you want, you know, it's kind of like the more the merrier, right? You know, the, the more people that come on Sunday morning, the bigger the party we'll have. And, and it's important that we come and worship Jesus together, but it sounds self-serving for me to say that. But I was reading just this week a study that was done on worship. In other words, what we're talking about is people like you who this morning woke up and said, out of all the places that I could be on Sunday morning, I'm going to be in church. Those people, those people gathering and proclaiming God's greatness with others. There was a study done, and and let me ask you a question, not a trick question at all. You're going to know the answer immediately. Would you say in the last 50 years in America... Church attendance has increased or has it decreased? Yeah. When I was in in Georgia, I was in the Bible Belt. And my daughter said to me, when you meet somebody in Georgia, where where she lives in Georgia, the Bible Belt, you you never ask them, do you go to church? They always ask, where do you go to church? It's just like assumed that everyone is going to be in church somewhere. Now, that doesn't mean they're all disciples of Jesus or committed or whatever. Um, But there was a study that was done, and I'm going to use a term that stood out to me in this study because it says that as church attendance has declined, what has increased is what they refer to as, get this term, Deaths of despair. Suicides. Overdoses. There have been other studies. There are studies after study that just say this to you and I. By being here in church this morning, by worshiping God, 
you're improving your health. You, you'll live longer than if you didn't come. And it, that's just what studies are showing. Membership is the second ship. And membership, I just, I just boil it down to this. You can count on me. You can count on me. And, and that's why for membership, we don't have, you know, like a, a mantra or a, a ritual or whatever. We look for people who, who can be counted on. And people who become members of the church have already been acting like members. They've already been committed. You can count on me. Fellowship, being known and knowing other Christians. We do this primarily. It's not the only way, but in small groups. We've got all kinds of groups that are meeting in the church. I'm a part of a small group on Wednesday morning where where men get together at 7 o'clock from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock share our lives with one another, and read through a book. By the way, we we are finishing a book this coming Wednesday, but in this book there is an appendix that is a devotional for Lent, a 40-day devotional. And if you want to be part of that, come see me. I'll get a book in your hand so when we begin that, you can be part of this this study. The fourth fourth, uh, ship is stewardship, serving God with our time, money, and skills. This morning, I sat in my downstairs office and went over this message because that's what I do on Sunday mornings, part of what I do on Sunday mornings. And as I read that, I made a correction to it. And I highlighted that correction. Because you see, in that phrase, the word hour should not appear. It's not serving God with our time money, skills. It is serving God with time, money, skills. You know why? Because none of us know how much time we have left. I know that right now God has given me breath and my lungs and life. I don't know about a minute from now. And that's not meant to like freak us out. It's just the reality of life that our very breath is in God's hand. And if our very breath is in God's hand, then certainly everything that he's given us by way of money and resources and skills are in his hands too. The fifth one is fellowship. Fellowship, just following Jesus, reaching out. Jesus said, follow me, and I'll make you a fisher of people, a fisher of men, reaching out, sharing Christ in practical ways with others, inviting others to experience God and his people. You know, for us that are gathered here, and this is where we find ourselves every Sunday morning, we don't know the depths of despair that some people are going through that have no place like this on a Sunday morning. And, and for those of us that are here today and you think, well, I come here regularly, but I'm feeling a little despair. Think about how much worse it would be without this kind of environment. And then the final one is discipleship. And this is simply doing what it takes to become like Jesus. Doing what it takes to become like Jesus. And just like every other thing in your schedule, discipleship will not happen by accident. You are not going to wake up one morning and say, wow, I've arrived. I am a disciple of Jesus. I am closer to Jesus Today, more than I've ever been, I know more of his word. He speaks to me more. My relationships, uh, not without intentionality. That's why Jesus said, follow me. They had to do something. And again, I want to invite you. I would love to have as many as possible come to the new prayer meeting at 9 o'clock. You're you're already committed to being here. So if you want to pray from 9 to 9.30, we welcome you. Commit to being a disciple of Christ and not a dabbler. And then finally, choose to embrace the future and not live in the past. Just recently, I, I read this story that just... I, I can't even describe to you how this story hit me at, at such a deep level. But the story comes from the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp in Germany during World War II. Uh, 
maybe you've heard of it, but this would be the concentration camp, Bergen-Belsen, that the famous author, The Diary of Anne Frank, this would be the camp that she would perish in just 16 days before it was liberated by the Allied forces. And in the diary of a lieutenant colonel who was there and witnessed the liberation of the camp, you can probably imagine the, the horror that he saw. But he tells of this unusual event that happened that nobody knows how it happened or, or who was the cause of it. But he said that, that no one knows exactly who is responsible for it, but along with life-sustaining supplies, because as you can imagine, they came into camp and there were skeletons greeting them. Sometimes hard to tell the living from the dead. So all these supplies started to come from the British Red Cross. And he said this, that along with life-saving supplies arrived a large quantity of red lipstick. And he writes these words in his diary. I wish so much that I could discover who did it. It was the action of genius, sheer, unadulterated brilliance. I believe nothing did more for those internees than the lipstick. Women lay in bed with no sheets and no nighty, but with scarlet red lips. You saw them wandering about with nothing but a blanket over their shoulders, but with scarlet red lips. At last, someone had done something to make them individuals again. They were someone, no longer merely the number tattooed on their arm. That lipstick started to give them back their humanity. Perhaps also that that red lipstick was also a small representation to them of putting the hell of the past behind them. And even though their steps would be wobbly at best, to take those wobbly steps of hope for the future. Now let me ask you a question. When it comes to embracing the future, not living in the past, none of us would probably stand and say, yeah, my experience has been like this to, or to this degree, but there are some of us in here this morning, we need some red lipstick. We need something small to hold on to, and I believe that verse 3 can be our red lipstick. He or she is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Let me give you quickly three three benefits, if you will, of delighting in Jesus. Because guess what? If this was true when they were delighting in the law of the Lord, which was only the the road to the final destination, according to Romans 10.4, then how much more for followers of Jesus? Results. Results. That yields... It's fruit in its season. Now remember, he's talking about a tree here. That that tree that is planted by streams of water yields not just fruit. In, like if it, if it said, like a tree planted by streams of water that yields fruit in season. Hey, that, we would have understood that. But it specifically says twice, and I looked this up, it's, it's there in the original language, it's there in the ancient Greek version of the, of the Old, Old Testament as well. It specifically says, brings forth its fruit in its season. And I said, why is it doing that? And all of a sudden it dawned on me that although it's using the picture of the tree planted by streams of water, that tree represents each one of us when we choose to delight in Jesus. And let me say it like this. When you delight in Jesus, Jesus has fruit that is unique to you. You will bear fruit, but it will be your fruit, and it will be your season. And I believe, and this is something I have struggled with my entire life, 
that one of the quickest roads to unhappiness is to compare ourselves with others. Because when we compare ourselves with others, we will always lose out. Because there will always be someone that can do it better or whatever the case is. There will always be someone more superlative. And I think the Bible is saying here, look, you're a tree. Tree, plug into Jesus. Be like that, that uh, tree that's getting lo- the life-giving water. But don't compare yourself with others. Don't compare yourself with others outside the church. Don't compare yourselves with others inside the church. We are to be in community with one another, not competition. And, that, and that's why, I, I, I don't know, God, Beth and I wouldn't take credit for this, but you know what? Beth and I are one another's biggest cheerleaders. When she, when she hits a me- message out of the park, I am not envious, I am not jealous, I am, I'm excited for her. Because God has given her those, those gifts of communication. And on that rare occasion where I may <laughs> get something right, she'll be the first one to let me know. I'm not in competition with her. In fact, I wrote an article for uh, this little magazine thing uh, called When the Best Preacher in the House is a She. <laughs> Don't compare yourself with others. Results. Second is revi- re- resilience. Its leaf does not wither. Now, I had a little problem with this one because I look back over the last several months and I said, God, when I look at my life and the struggles that sometimes are so intense and dark to me with depression and just, just going through dark valleys, I said, I said Lord, I, 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 felt like I, I feel like I'm withering sometimes. And as soon as I said that, it's like I heard the Spirit of God say, you bounce back. Have you ever seen a tree that looked like it was going to die and all of a sudden it bounces back? That's what you'll gain by being a disciple of Jesus and then rewards. In all that he does, he prospers. What, what rewards are we talking about here? I don't know because it's going to be your rewards, your season in all that he does. So let me ask you this. What do you do? (laughs) What do you do? Some of us here this morning, we need parenting advice. Some of us this morning need marriage advice. Some of us need other relationship advice. Some of us need career advice. Some of us need wisdom in this area, that, that area. I don't know the answers, but God does. Let's pray. And I just want you to take just a few seconds to just hear what Jesus might be saying to you today. Maybe you've been on that road where, where what is popular has overshadowed what is right. Maybe, maybe you're here today and you can say, yeah, I gave my life to Christ. I prayed the prayer. I confessed that Jesus is Lord. I believe that God raised him from the dead. But you need to commit to being a disciple of Christ. Some of us today, maybe we need to take up that verse 3 and let it be our red lipstick this week, this month, this year. that I'm going to bear fruit. It's not going to look like someone else's. It's going to be mine. It's fruit. It's season. And even in times where I feel like I'm sinking and withering, because of Jesus, I can bounce back. Let's just take a moment to hear Jesus.
Lord, I'm reminded that whether we see it in the Old Testament or the New Testament, that your instruction is always for our good. And Father, you know the thoughts and plans that you have for each one of us. You know the thoughts and plans that you have for this church. Lord, may we hear what you are saying to us as your people. I pray today, Lord, that for some, the day would be a new beginning. A new beginning in Christ, a new beginning in discipleship. Lord, have your way with us. Give us a heart that delights in you. That delights in you. That others say, hey, what's gotten into you? You're different. You talk less about this and more about this. Now that Jesus is your delight. Lord, hear our prayers. In Jesus' name.